Let me read to you a passage from the fifth chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, verses 38 to 42. It's the Gospel for Monday of the eleventh week in ordinary time. St. Matthew writes, Jesus said to his disciples, You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other as well. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. That's from Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 42. What does it suggest to us? Well, it speaks of love. What do I mean? Well, you know, there are those who build a lot of their Christian system on particular texts of the Scriptures. They are armed with texts and their explanations of them, and they go forth to conquer. The problem is that in respect to the most important books of the Scriptures, which are the four Gospels, texts cannot be used in a simplistic manner. To give but one example, when our Lord says that we, if we ask, we shall always receive, what are we to make of those occasions when he was asked for something by someone and did not give it? For instance, at the Last Supper, our Lord took off his outer garment and proceeded to kneel down and wash the feet of his disciples in turn. When he came to Simon Peter, Peter expostulated, Lord, you must never wash my feet. It was a firm and insistent request made by Simon to our Lord. Do not wash my feet. Peter asked, but he did not receive. Indeed, our Lord told him that if he, Peter, persisted in his refusal to let him wash his feet, their association would be at an end. Other examples could be given of requests that were made to our Lord and which were denied. So, the true meaning of our Lord's words in any particular text must be sought, and for this a wider context is often needed, the context of the rest of the Gospel, the context of the rest of the Scriptures, and the context of the mind and the tradition of the Church. The same Holy Spirit who authored a particular text, and the particular Gospel of which that text is a part, and all four Gospels, and the entire Scriptures, is the same Holy Spirit who guides the Church in her understanding and statement of the doctrine of Revelation. This is the broader context in which we must situate any particular text of Scripture. That is not to say that in order to understand a particular passage, the reader must necessarily and always launch into a lengthy investigation of those various contexts. It does mean, though, that one's mind should be formed within this broader context and tradition in order to interpret well particular elements in that context and tradition. In order to understand well the teaching of Christ, one should strive to put on the mind of Christ. And that mind is the mind of the Church. All this is not to say, though, that one should explain away or ignore the teaching of our Lord when it is especially demanding. Our Gospel today is a case in point. If one thinks of the sweep of human history, the attack of one man on another is always met with a counter-attack, unless self-interest and prudent strategy advises otherwise. The general law is that an eye is given for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And it very often goes beyond this to double or treble measure. The response to an offence is anger, and this anger leads to violence. Of course, crimes in society must be punished by law. But the question here is the pattern that prevails in the human heart. There has always been a great deal of violence among human beings. That is the pattern in human history. And it means that there has always been a great deal of violence surging in the human heart. There is anger and resentment in families, among clans and tribes, within and among societies, and across the face of the world. The instinctive conviction among so many would be that to expect a peaceful response to an offence 
is unreasonable. An offence cannot be suffered to go unanswered and unrequited. But now, Jesus Christ has come and has declared a new law. There is to be a new pattern, and it is based on his practice. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other as well. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Of course, our Lord is employing characteristic Semitic hyperbole, hyperbole. The evil person, ordinary reason would indicate, must be resisted. One cannot encourage the evil person in his deeds, which is to say by inviting him to continue in his evil path. In fact, our Lord elsewhere in the Gospel stresses that the evildoer must be corrected and, if necessary, cast out of the church's communion. But what is manifestly clear is that Christ is commanding that evil must be met by love. Love is the answer to hate. Love is the answer to offence and evil. The Christian overcomes evil by the highest standards of good. So what can we take from our Gospel passage today that I read earlier? We must put on the mind of Christ and make his heart the model of what ought be going on in our heart. The true battleground of the world is the heart of man. We think of the troubled spots of the world, the terrorism, the clash of forces, the threats to world peace. Rather, there is a world war going on in the hearts of men. Anger, resentment, sin surges along day by day in the human heart. And this has to be replaced by the Spirit of Christ. We must learn to love from the heart in imitation of the Master. And this is possible by the power of grace. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Yes, let the fire of love grow, the love of Christ, and let the fires of hate be quenched.